too far today. Why you start beating the shit out of him? What is wrong with you, man? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. This one's brought to you by Geology. Get out there and explore some rocks. Not really. It's a skincare brand. No, no. I don't know why it's called Geology. More about them in a bit. Maybe we'll find out. Maybe we won't. Ah, Mr. Blobby. The stuff of absolute f***ing nightmares. Mr. Blobby was around. And I mean, we're going to get in and explain this, dear Americans. A any British person is like, exact knows exactly what I'm talking about. Mr. Blobby is f***ing weird. For me, very young Simon, absolutely f***ing terrifying. Why, Mr. Blobby? Why must you haunt my nightmares? You mother psychopath skin wearing fool daddy chill it's more scary than all the horror things it's like yeah 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 like so and so he cuts your face off and wears it as a mask he wears your eyeballs as a necklace and it's like then mr blobby comes along he's like whoa, 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 whoa. it's like Fuck. what the hell is even that for a surprisingly big chunk of the 90s one star shone a pinkish glow over the uk which was brighter than kurt cobain the Spice Girls, Macaulay Culkin, The Simpsons, and Jennifer Aniston's haircut all mashed together in one giant celebrity glissable package. I don't know who any of those people are except for The Simpsons. I'm just joking, I know who all of them are! Especially... Uh... Kurt Cobain. <laughs> bow, 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 bow. Wait, is that the White Stripes? <laughs> That is the white stripes, isn't it? Simon, you f***ing genius! What the hell is even that?! This guy was always on the TV. He was at the top of the music charts. He was on your lunchbox. He was in the face of a new chain of theme parks. He haunted the darkest nightmares of UK comedian Jack Whitehall and generic bald YouTube personality Simon Whistler. I don't know who you are, Jack Whitehall, but I'm glad I'm not the only one who was f***ing haunted by Mr. Blobby. His name was Mr. Blobby, and he was a giant crap pink rubber jelly monster who turned out to be one of the most lucrative properties of the decade. And he was a terrifying monstrosity who should never have been unleashed from the bowels of TV hell. To tell the story of Mr. Blobby, we first need to look at one of the men who is instrumental in his creation, Noel Edmonds. Noel Edmonds is undoubtedly one of the most famous and successful UK broadcasters of the last 50 years, starting out as the youngest ever DJ on Radio 1 in 1969 and going on to front some of the biggest TV shows of all time including his 30 uh, during his initial 30 year stint in the limelight it was Noel Edmonds house party right I remember like watching that with this Mr. Bloy. I think my parents liked it. I don't remember much about it. I wouldn't go so far as to call him a national treasure, a title usually bestowed for the likes of David Attenborough, John Cleese, Judy Dench, and Thomas the Tank Engine. Noel openly admits that he's a Marmite kind of guy. You either love him or you hate him. I feel largely indifferent towards him. But to be fair, I think the Marmite effect only surfaced during the latter stages of his long winding career. For the most part, he was the hugely popular face of BBC television and perhaps more influential and pioneering than many people care to remember, which is quite remarkable considering that he couldn't sing, dance, or act, and he was never particularly funny. Look, Daddy, lots of people watch me on YouTube. I cannot sing, I cannot dance, I cannot act, and I'm not particularly funny. <laughs> Sounds like your qualifiers for success are a bit off, Danny. I'm just a dick. And that works. And look, it works for all those other classic dickheads as well. Piers Morgan, that guy who owns Sky, uh, the fat guy uh, who fell off the boat, and um, oh, fuck, the last guy who Danny particularly hates. Philip Green! Yes, the classic dickheads of Business Blaze. Maybe she, there should be some sort of table or chart with them somehow. And also me. I definitely belong. Maybe fifth place. Maybe. The best thing he had going for him was his nice, tidy beard. <laughs> Don't even have that. But he was just a warm and engaging and professional broadcaster who consistently delivered the goods. Honestly, that is more important. It, like, being likable, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't think I'm particularly likable. I do think I'm quite engaging, at least according to the statistics. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's where I fall down. Very consistent, yes, but professional broadcaster, absolutely f***ing not. <laughs> <laughs> He's hosted everything from Top of the Pops to Top Gear! Wow! Back when it was a serious show about cars, long before Jeremy Clarkson and his buddies hijacked the format and turned it into a comedy about three grumpy middle-aged men. Bad news! Oh no! Anyway, last week... <laughs> and everyone's happier that that's what it's about. Top Gear's like Business Blaze. I mean, it's a lot better, of course, but it's like it starts off about cars. 
and no one really liked that. And then it became about three dudes having a good time. Business plays started off about business, and then it became an absolute show which people seem to prefer. And Noel Edmonds helped transform the landscape of children's television in the late 1970s with the multicolored swap shop. This was the first, never heard of this one, this was the first chapter in a new phase for British kids television in which three, uh, in which a three hour live magazine show would take up Saturday, Saturday morning schedules for the next 30 years. Did I miss this? It was always cartoons, I'd always watch cartoons. It was one of the first ever shows in which the presenters adopted the intriguing new policy of talking to the young audience as if they were your mate, rather than addressing you in a manner of a snotty teacher looking down at your classroom <laughs> at a classroom packed with plebs. I wonder why that was more popular. Although it's really weird because one thing children love is being talked down to. By the 1980s, Noel was well on his way to becoming the king of light entertainment. The curiously titled Late Late Breakfast Show. <laughs> I'd say it's quite a clever title. It was actually a central primetime Saturday evening viewing, featuring comedy segments, hidden camera stunts, and pop music performances. But it looked as if Noel's career might be heading for an early brunch in 1986 when he, the producers forgot the golden rule of television. Try not to kill your audience. Oh, sh the Give It A Whirl segment of the show encouraged viewers to nominate their buddies to participate in a jaw-dropping stunt the following week, such as jumping through hoops of fire or riding a wall of death on a motorbike. Holy I mean, jumping through a thing of fire, it's like, well, you're not going to get burnt. It's going to be real quick, isn't it? But the wall, it's the, the wall of death of the motorbike is where you ride it around that thing like crazy, right? And you're at a vertical, no, horizontal angle, big brain. You're at a horizontal angle. That looks absolutely f***ing terrifying. There had already been strong concerns over the show's bright idea of roping in members of the public to have a go at the kind of death-defying stunts that you'd usually expect to see performed by experienced professionals. Very early on on the show's run, a woman by the name of Barbara Sleeman broke her shoulder after being fired from a cannon for shits and giggles. Holy sh**, this is intense. She later grumbled, The BBC don't give a damn, they just want viewers. I mean... Yes, I mean, you're stating the blindingly obvious. The BBC is, the corporation is literally, it's, uh, BBC stands for big, but, oh no, 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 that's a different, uh, British Broadcasting Corporation. And it's right there in the title. Corporations don't care about you. The BBC cares about views. It's like, Rain Blaze. I don't care about you. I just care about the views. <laughs> that's not true. I love you. Thank you for watching. Perch the merch. Things look <laughs> savage. Things took a more tragic turn when a 24-year-old guy called Michael Lush agreed to participate in a stunt which involved bungee jumping from an exploding box suspended 120 feet in the air by, the, by a crane. Holy shit, the 80s were a different time. You'd just be like, yeah, 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 what can we do? Well, let's combine bungee jumping with explosions. And someone's like, yes, yes. Michael had clearly decided it might be fun to give this a whirl. Ba -da -bum -bum during the very first rehearsal, Michael was instantly killed. No, he wasn't. Someone at I holy sh Danny said try not to kill your audience. I thought we'll go to something that was that went wrong. Oh my god, that is insane. Michael was killed instantly when the carabiner clip that was attached to his bungee rope to the crane sprang loose. Uh, the inquest recorded a verdict of misadventure, although the BBC was later found to have breached safety regulations and fined two thousand pounds. I feel that that's, that's missing a few zeros. The organization had already made an ex gratia payment of £120,000 to the family of Michael. Give me your fucking money! I feel like we live in a different time now, don't we? Or like maybe a different country. Like in America, it'd be like, yeah, you were killed on a TV show that was about dangerous stunts that the public shouldn't be doing, and you got £120,000, which is what, like, I don't know, about the same, $180,000, just guessing. It's like, but that, that seems like very, very low. <laughs> Perhaps not surprisingly, the Late Late Breakfast show was swiftly taken off the air and a distraught Noel Edmonds appeared from the sat disappeared from the Saturday night schedule. But not for long. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he might his show might kill someone, but if he pulls in the ratings, it's like he's not getting cancelled. This is like the 80s version. Back in the day to get cancelled, you have to like kill someone. These days it's like, yeah, you just have to say a naughty word, <laughs> which you shouldn't say. <laughs> Within a couple of years, he was back again on the box with more mirth and mayhem and slightly fewer deaths, and by 1991 he had launched what would become, arguably, his biggest ever TV hit. Noel's House Party! I was called Noel's House Party. It was another serving 
of comic sketches and games and pranks and celebrity guest appearances, but this time the twist was that the live studio setting was meant to represent Noel's living room in his house in the fictional village of Crinkly Bottom. <laughs> To be honest, it wasn't exactly the height of sophistication, and it could be argued that Noel had gone a bit low rent by this point. The main ingredients of the show was slapstick and innuendo, and the grand climax usually involved the gunge tank. <laughs> this is so weak. A lineup of desperate celebrities would sit in oh, I do remember this would sit in transparent booths and wait to hear the results of a live phone vote, which determined which one of them was hated by the public to deem be deemed worthy of the humiliation of getting heavily drenched from above with thick, gooey slime. Famous victims of the gunge tank over the years included Piers Morgan, David Hasselhoff, Der Jeremy Clarkson, and the Chuckle Brothers. Oh my god, I remember the Chuckle Brothers. It's pretty insufferable stuff, UK. One of the better segments of the show was the gotchas. This involved playing often quite elaborate hidden camera pranks on celebrity figures of the day, after which Noel would jump into their chaotic proceedings to present the befuddled and often genuinely pissed off celebrity with a coveted gotcha trophy. And it was the gotchas that spawned the demonic seeds of Mr. Blobby. Is that, what's that? Did Ashton Kutcher present a show like that? Um, where they'd prank celebrities? <laughs> it's quite funny. I'd find Hate this. <laughs> it's odd to think that one of the most famous, if deeply disturbing, faces of the decade was actually designed to be purposefully pathetic and lame. The whole point of Mr. Blobby is that he was meant to be absolute crap. The original idea behind the short series of gotchas in the second season of Noel's House Party in 1992 is that a celebrity would be duped into believing that they were taking part in a new children's TV show called Mr. Blobby. <laughs> Oh my god, if you're a celebrity and it's like you're at the point where you're appearing on a show and you genuinely believe that Mr. Blobby, image here, Sam, is the uh, is the character that this show is using, it's like, oh man, this is some D-list isn't it? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, this is like people who appeared on Love Island two seasons ago. No! When the celebrity victim arrived on set to film their short piece with the title character, they'd be greeted with the grotesque sight of a seven-foot pink rubber blanche mo blank 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 mange? Blanc mange monster with wild googly eyes pointing out in different directions. The character was seemingly only capable of screaming out the words blobby blobby blobby, but it's like it's more like electronically distorted and weird. I'll put a clip in here, or Sam will put a clip in here, but we'll have to remove it because the BBC are like super hardcore about like, ah, 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 you used half a second of our clip in a complete fair use example. And then they'll just be like, F you, we're taking all of the money for this video fact, boy. It's like, F you, BBC. You assholes, allegedly. Uh, in a hideously electronically distorted voice, yes, before he clumsily went around wrecking havoc on the cheap set, <laughs> knocking down all the scenery and disrupting the filming schedule to the increasingly comical frustration of the celebrity who was oblivious to the fact that this was all just a wind up. It's actually very funny. Watching these early appearances of Mr. Blobby again today he seems quite weird as he wasn't yet an independent character working alongside Noel Edmonds. During these pranks, Noel is actually hiding inside the ridiculous rubber costume and the big reveal comes as the at the end of the segment when he lifts off his giant rubber head to expose his true identity and present the gotcha trophy to the celebrity it's also weird because these original segments are actually quite funny there's something deliciously bizarre about watching a celebrity gradually lose their cool after being made to work with a character who's clearly too preposterous and destructive to be the star of a real tv show naturally after these segments aired on television there was no way mr blobby could be used again for a hidden camera prank as the cat was very much out of the bag the story should have ended on a high note but it didn't. And how did it, did it not, did it never, I don't know, I didn't finish reading it before I put it down, but I would like to tell you about today's glorious sponsor, Geology. This box actually looks in amazing condition because they sent me to. I took one home, used it. Oh, it's skincare, by the way. I took one home, used it, and then I was like, oh, I see why you sent me a second one. <laughs> because it's like, I don't know about you, but like, shit I put in my bathroom just naturally gets nasty. And it's like, yeah, why is I, maybe I've got hard water, but everything kind of gets those like weird water stains on the outside and all of that. So uh, yeah, they sent me a nice clean box that I can demonstrate. So what is geology? It's a simple skincare routine formulated for daily use. The product's great for both individuals who are new to skincare and seasoned skincare experts. I definitely find fall into like the new category, and I know we're already wildly off the talking points, but when geology approached me for a sponsorship, I was like, I don't know, I just like, I slap on some moisturizer, everything seems to work out. I'm kind of like generally 
blessed with having quite good skin. I mean, occasionally I get like an ingrowing hair or whatever. And she were like, oh, bloody hell, Simon, just take the goddamn quiz, okay? So you take this like diagnostic quiz or whatever. I don't know why I did this, it is a diagnostic quiz. And I was like, oh, I missed something. I'm getting aged, I'm getting old, I'm getting a little bit wrinkly. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I got no problems, but let's go for the anti-aging one, because I'm a vain mother So yeah, I mean, reduced dark and puffy eyes, not something I generally have, unless I've had a very, very heavy night. Uh, fight acne and keep your oily skin under control. Again, not an issue for me, but then, the last one. Protect your skin and reduce fine lines and wrinkles. Also, I tend to like, I don't know, like, especially on this channel and stuff, it's a constant like laughing at shit. It's like you get these lines around your eyes, and I'm like, I could do something about that. So, quick whip through of the products that they sent me. By the way, they all look very nice. There's a everyday face wash, there's actually two of these, right there on the tin, every day. Use it every day. There are two for people who go to the gym and stuff. I just kept one at work because I have a shower at work and uh, I just kept one here. So now I have three here and one at home. It's confusing. Don't worry about it. This is just my personal situation, which no one wants to hear about. Ah! And then what else? Of course, ah, oh, this is the repairing night cream. Slap that on before you go to bed. Honestly, I don't really know why. I'm just like, look, guys, you're the experts. I'll do what you say. And then the Vital Morning Face Cream. Yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> I use it on my face, not anywhere else. So, uh, you got that as well. And then you've also got this one, which is a nourishing eye cream, which is more intense. Like, you put it under your eyes. It's, uh, it's good stuff. I've used some of these, like, styles of creams before, and it's like, when you get too close to the eyes, it's like, ooh, you know, it's not so nice. Or it feels really fresh, but not in a good way. You know, that kind of, like, overly fresh way that makes your eyes water? Not with this, baby. You can continue with 90 Day Supplies and the products you love the most. You can subscribe and save, or you can go a la carte, depending on what you prefer. You're in control. This isn't one where it's like, yeah, you have to subscribe. It's you, you don't have to if you don't want to. You can just buy from the store, which is also nice. You've got both options. Why not? They also have 3,000 five-star customer reviews, which is excellent. Yeah, I'd give them five stars. I mean, I know. <laughs> it's like, Simon, that sounds like an honest review. I <laughs> It'd be, I don't think they'd be, be very happy if I was like, yeah, two stars, it's all right. <laughs> but it is genuinely rather good. Head to geology.com and take their free skincare quiz to save up to 40% on your 30-day trial, or just click the link below. That's geology.com, 40% off on a 30-day trial. Link below. Oh, by the way, also instruction cards come in the box, which is useful because I was like, you don't want to have to go look up online after it's been shipped. So that's very handy. Good job. The following year. Oh yeah, so back to Mr. Blobby and his crazy shit. The following year, Mr. Bolly was bought, bra brought, bra 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 the following year, Mr. Blobby was brought back as a recurring character on the main part of the show to interact with Noel and his weekly celebrity guests in the studio. The man inside the prestigious pink suit was now a guy called Barry Killaby, who was actually a classically trained Shakespearean actor, but will forever be remembered as the man who played Mr. Bobby Blobby for over seven years. That's a bit depressing, isn't it? I mean, it's not, because I'm sure he got well paid, and it's like, who are you? Mr. I, I was Mr. Blobby. Everyone's gonna know that. But also, you're like Shakespearean actor. It's like, that's that's pretty pretty high up there <laughs> in terms of like acting skill. By the way, I just comment that this coffee is f***ing horrible, because I ran out of the little capsules for my uh, Nespresso machine, and uh, I had this instant coffee, but it had gone all hard, and it's horrible. It is hard to imagine what must have been going through his head during the long period he spent on his career-defining role. The problem is that there were serious limitations as to what the character could actually do. Mr. Blobby appeared to be in a permanent state of overexcitement. His vocabulary was strictly limited to his killer catchphrase, Blobby, Blobby, Blobby! And all he could really do was fall over himself, bump into furniture, and occasionally throw himself at celebrities in a bid to drag them down with him. In short, Mr. Bobby's job was just to behave like a colossal prick. And yet, the kids seemed to fall in love with his- No, they didn't! No, they didn't! He's scary! I hated Mr. Blobby when I was- Like, he terrified me more than anything else. Like, he looked like a fat, jaundiced baby. Speak for yourself, motherfucker. Yet, the kids seemed to fall in love with his new force of nature. The brave kids, anyway. <laughs> the cowardly cutlets just hid under their bedclothes and begged for the nightmares to stop. F Danny. Noel's house party would only get more and more popular over the next few years, pulling in a peak of over 15 million viewers. But Mr. Blobby also began to enjoy a life outside of Crinkly Bottom. He made frequent guest appearances on other shows, and he became the go-to cheap celebrity superstar that you would book to switch on your town's Christmas illuminations or cut a ribbon often with hilarious and entirely unpredictable results. Suddenly, the whole of the UK had been engulfed in Blobby mania. It's horrible. I just have yeah, Teletubbies? 
They're joyous things. Blobby is evil. Noel Edmonds was already pulling in a very tidy figure to match his very tidy beard. He had other lucrative business interests outside of Crinkly Bottom, including his uh, formation of the Unique Group, which supplied the BBC and independent radio programming. And he was reportedly getting paid about $5 million of TV licensed tax fair money for the first four seasons of House Party alone. Wait, was he getting £5 million a year or £5 million over four years? Because, like, there's a big difference. Like, £5 million a year is like, holy sh**. But, like, over, then it, uh, otherwise, like, being on one of the most popular shows on TV, it's not that great, is it? If it's just a million. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's great, but it's like, it's the most popular show. But he appeared to be a shrewd businessman who was keen to exploit as much as he could from his popular new creation who had seemingly fallen out of a particularly bad LSD trip and taken on a life of his own. Wait, so he actually created it then? It was Noel Edmonds' idea? That's gonna be lucrative. Unless the BBC was like, yo Noel, we were paying you to come up with ideas so it's our idea which also does kind of seem what was going on, but okay. There was naturally a novelty single. The four minutes of ear-melting madness entitled Simply Mr. Blobby was released in time for the 1993 Christmas market and ended up as the UK's number one Christmas single, beating off the likes of Meatloaf and Take That. That's kind of terrible, isn't it? Now regularly topping polls as the worst single of all time, often the worst sound of all time, Rupert Hawksley from The Telegraph made an uncannily accurate prediction when he noted at the time, Mr. Blobby has set the bar so low with this bizarre single, it's hard to imagine that it could ever be usurped. <laughs> I did that posh voice because it's The Telegraph, which is this kind of like uh, conservative broadsheet newspaper in the UK that's just a bit I don't know. It's exactly... Look, people called Rupert are exactly the sort of people who write for and read The Telegraph. That says it all, doesn't it, Rupert? A second single and a whole album were to follow shortly afterwards. Literally hundreds of different pieces of Blobby merchandise hit the UK shops, including Mr. Blobby dolls, condiment shakers, bubble bath, pink lemonade, lampshades, and egg cup sets. 1994 even saw the release of the official Mr. Blobby video game developed by Millennium Interactive for the Amiga and the PC. Playing the Amiga version of the simple platform game today, I have to say that it's not a terrible game, although it's unlikely to win any awards for originality. The exact opposite, in fact. It was initially intended to be an official port of the other popular SNES game Super Troll Islands, but when the license for this was snatched from under Millennium Interactive's noses, they just stuck Mr. Blobby in there and hoped that nobody would mind. But all of this still wasn't good enough for Noel Edmonds. He wanted to go next level. He wanted to go Walt Disney. Noel, I understand your passion. If something is working for you, just ride it. And with that in mind, in 1994, his production company Unique announced the opening of the first three Mr. Blobby theme parks in the UK. Oh my god, that's gonna be a big investment. I mean, making a TV show and stuff, yes, it's expensive. Much less nowadays, but it's, I mean, like, this sort of TV. Obviously, like, you know, a Westworld and something, it's like, holy shit. But like, making a, it's easier now. Like, it's easier. Um, but making a theme park? Very expensive. Well, technically, these new TV leisure parks went under the name of Crinkly Bottom, but Mr. Blobby was certainly the star attraction, and the parks were often referred to as Blobbyland. Located in Somerset, Morecambe, and Lowestoft, Lo people are always like, Simon, why didn't you know how to pronounce random British towns? And I'm like, yo, just because you're from around there and you've heard of it, like, there's a lot of random weird towns in the UK, and they've all got stupid names, and they've all got stupid pronunciations. And don't even get me started on f***ing Wales, where well, you're crazy ass no vowel sh Whales, the most spectacular creatures on the planet. Oh, Simon, don't be racist against Welsh people. I'm not racist against Welsh people. It's just your stupid language. Look, and English is stupid as well. And that's the one I speak. Like why, especially UK English, US English is a little more sensible. But like, who the f spells center R-E? Theater R-E. What is going on? It's not a centra. It's not a theatre. It's a theater, isn't it? E-R, Holy shit. Daddy, chill. And the theme parks featured an amazing opportunity to take a wander around Mr. Blobby's house, where, in a fabulous bit of world building, we were introduced to his wife for the first time, who went by, wait for it, Mrs. Blobby. You could say you could also take a short trip on a steam train, enjoy an indoor water ride, and indulge in a photo opportunity with Mr. Blobby himself while sitting on a pink and yellow bench. There possibly wasn't quite enough blobbiness in the world to fill an entire theme park, so other attractions roped in the talents of Noddy, Big Ears, and the animals of Farthing Woods. 
Wait, so you just took other random IP and put it in your theme park? It's a bit weird. Remember the animals of Farthingwood? Haven't thought about that in literally 25 years. It wasn't exactly Disneyland, it was more like a few quick attractions hastily knocked up at very little cost. But after the first park opened in a wildlife park in Somerset in July 1994, it attracted no less than 650,000 visitors within the opening season, significantly more than Buckingham Palace, which could only manage about 420,000. Ah, Buckingham Palace, those are some amateur numbers, you piece of shit. Nope, nope, stop talking, go to jail. And you don't get an indoor what you don't get an indoor water ride at Buckingham Palace there or a chance to pose for a jolly photo with the Queen. Yeah, of course. Even as an adult, if someone was like, would you rather go to Buckingham Palace, which I've never been to, or would you rather go to a theme park? I'd be like, like a proper theme park for adults. I mean I know theme parks are for children, but like Alton Towers and stuff, or like what's the Thought Park? Six Flags Americans, like that is a good day out, especially if it's not too busy. I think I've told this story before, but I went to a Six Flags in Mexico once and it was empty. It was like my childhood dream come reality. It was unreal. Like I was walking around being like, this is like dreams I had as a child. We'd get on that roller coaster. Like you'd ride the biggest roller coaster and it would go on and you'd be like, this is amazing. And then it would pull into the stop. You know, and it, there'd be no one waiting to get on. And the guy running the, the ride would be like, you guys want to go again? I mean, there's no one waiting. And we'd be like, hell yeah! Rode it like eight times, got so sick. Um, and also, but then, like, the queues. There were signs saying, like, queue here is about three hours. And it was just, you'd just be like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. ride me again! That's a little gay. Hold on. Unbelievable. Greatest day, one of the greatest days of my life. Like, forget the birth of my first child. Forget, I don't know. All the other exciting, like, cliche shit that happens in your life. Getting married. It's like, no. 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 Six flags. Empty. Yes. I hope my wife doesn't watch this video. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. The prob- She was there, though. She knows how much of a good time it was. However, Mr. Blobby's theme park empire quickly encountered problems and courted controversy with the locals. Uh, there were complaints about the excessive noise from the Somerset theme park, allegations that the park had been built without proper planning permission, and concerns from English heritage that the image of their idyllic grade one listed wildlife park had become somewhat soured by the crash landing of Mr. Blobby and his wacky pals. Oh, you buzzkills, English heritage. Ah. Lame. A bigger problem hit the headline after the second park opened in Morecambe in 1994. Disgruntled customers began complaining about the lack of facilities and the fact that there wasn't really much to do in Blobbyland. Local residents were also upset that the park had been granted a liquor license as they feared this would lead to hooligan behavior in the drug or drug addled seaside town of Morecambe. <laughs> so brilliant what are we gonna do today let's go to bobby land and get absolutely fucked up <laughs> sounds kind of like a good time oh good times yeah in fairness to the customers after they'd exhausted all the options of the theme park there was probably not much other else to do except sit on the pink and yellow bench with mr blobby and get absolutely plastered in a bit to forget everything that just happened <laughs> the walk park was only actually open for 13 weeks before it was closed down following hugely disappointing ticket sales and this led to a legal battle between lancaster city Car council and noel's unique group the council sued the group for negligence and misrepresentation alleging that noel had breached his contract because he hadn't bothered pull putting in the promised public appearances to help drum up publicity. Uh-oh. In fact, it was the council who were found to have behaved in an imprudent, irrational, and unlawful manner when they kept moving the goalposts in their dealings with Unique and the prematurely t and then prematurely terminated the contract. Ah, this sucks to be you. Also, Noel had better lawyers, didn't he? <laughs> they ended up paying Noel's group just under a million pounds in damages. Holy shit, Noel, you killed a dude. No oh. Whoa, whoa, Simon, take that back. Take that shit. You don't want your own million pound lawsuit. Someone died in a TV program that you were involved with and as a presenter and nothing more legally and allegedly. Uh, and they got 120 grand. <laughs> it's like, you made a theme park that sucked. The council got pissed, sued you, and they had to give you a million pounds. I have to say, f legend. And the Garcia affair is said to have cost North Lancash to. Oh, yeah, it has to come from the taxpayers, though, doesn't it? <laughs> that kind of sucks. Oh uh, yeah, it cost them 2.6 million pounds. Fuck. <laughs>
now. Why did that happen though? Just, just be like, no. It's evil. In the aftermath of Blobbygate, nor quipped the press, we wanted people investigated because they cheated the people of Morecambe out of something very significant. I thought Morecambe was famous for shrimps. Now it's notorious for fudge. Oh, but a bum bum tsh, no, but a bum bum tsh. Wow, I mean, yeah, he wasn't, it's not a brilliant comedian, is, is it? Not, not, that's not the finest. <laughs> of finest jokes I've ever heard. Perhaps the biggest problem of all with the three doomed theme parks is that by the time the third one opened in Laustoft in 1996, poor old Mr. Blobby had already fallen from favor. He may have spent three weeks at the top of the music charts in 1990, uh, whoa, in 1993, but this next single, Christmas in Blobbyland, only just scraped into the top 40 while Mr. Blobby the album failed to chart at all. It seems a shame, as it appears not many people ever got to hear such toe-tapping classics as Stop it. Get some help. Blob Lake, T Pink Blobbies, Blobby Locks and the Three Bears, and old Blob 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 Blob, blob Mr. Blobby Black Blob Blob. blob. Fing hell, Danny. Old McBlobby had a farm. All that Blobby merchandise had been tossed into the bargain bins, and by 1998, all three theme parks had been deemed a financial disaster and closed down. It felt as if the UK had suddenly turned on Mr. Blobby, who was now seen as a symbol of capitalist oppression. No, I wasn't. <laughs> A symbol of everything that was wrong with Great Britain. It had become the target for mockery and sheer hatred from a population who were wondering how pink rubber dickhead had somehow evolved into the cultural icon of the 1990s. <laughs> ah, yes. I do feel like, uh, like that self-loathing is, uh, is something we British do quite well. It was clear that the mood of the nation had shifted when the press reported on a little girl's ill-fated birthday celebration for which Mr. Blobby had been hired as the VIP guest. Mr. Blobby had made a typically clumsy entrance on stage and proceeded to grab hold of the little girl's beautiful birthday cake and lob it onto the floor. Too far, Blobster! Shit. In response, the little girl's angry father stormed onto the stage and started giving Mr. Blobby <laughs> Dudes, everyone's going way too far today. Why are you start beating the shit out of him? What is wrong with you, man? Fuck. Weirdly, the father appeared to be hailed as a hero in the press. <laughs> Woo! Oh my god, but he is. Shit. <sighs> Did you just punch him? <laughs> she just punched him! Oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, <stop laughs> He's a hero for giving the fictional character a good public beating. And apparently all the kids at the party were weeping and cheering when Floppy went down. What was this girl's name? Oh, it doesn't say. <laughs> The character was quietly dropped from Noel's house party, which itself was facing huge problems towards the end of the decade, as ratings plummeted by more than half. The public mood had also turned on Noel himself, and even appeared to have lost his faith in his own show. One Saturday evening, the BBC made a curious announcement that they were unable to take viewers to Crinkly Bottom this week, and it turns out that Noel stormed off the set after refusing to front a show of such shitty quality. Although, house party limped along for another year. It was finally axed in 1999, with Mr. Blobby appearing for an emotional reunion with Noel at the climax of the final episode. Everyone's just waiting. Go on, Noel. Go on, Noel, mate. Come on, you smooth bearded motherfucker. Just beat the shit out of him. Get in there. Stop it. Get some help. We didn't hear much from Noel for the next six years. He'd been kept quite busy with the collapse of his unique group, which he blamed on corrupt banking staff down at the Reading branch of H Boss. <laughs> okay. But it's like some very low level corruption. It's like, where's the corruption occurring? Ah, oh, it's just at the local bank. Is that really a thing? Between 2003 and 2007, six bank staff, oh my god, it is definitely a thing, had been siphoning off funds and profits from business accounts, including those belonging to Unique and spending on luxury holidays and prostitutes. No fing way! That actually happened? Holy sh! I trust my bank way too. I'm never like checking if any money's going on. I'm always like, I don't know. I guess it's very irresponsible. I basically never check my bank accounts. Oh my god, Simon, you shouldn't admit this on the internet. People will, like, break into it and steal your shit. But I just can't, like, my business ones, I'm like, well, my accountant's gonna notice. But my personal ones, I'm like, I just don't pay attention to. I'm a bad person. It's gone. It's all gone. What's all gone? The money in your account. It didn't do too well. It's gone. What do you mean? I, I have $100. Not anymore, you don't. Poof. My dad always has a go at me for that. He's always like, Simon, why don't you keep a closer eye on that? I'm like, I don't know. 
Why? It's so boring. <laughs> All six were found guilty and sentenced to prison with the ringleader receiving a total of 15 years. God damn. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, f you. Noel had been seeking 60 million in damages from Lloyds Bank. Wait, is that a different bank? Who had since acquired HBOS. Oh, okay. But he made do with a private settlement, which was reportedly in the region of £5 million. He did eventually make a big TV comeback in 2005. Oh, yeah, he did Deal or No Deal. That's the most stupid game show ever. It's just about people randomly choosing boxes. It's the just, it's so dumb. There's no skill. It's just chance. And then you have to make a decision about whether this banker offers you enough money. It is f***ing stupid. If you watch that show, you're probably stupid. You know they do those online IQ tests? There should just be one where it's like, okay, if this triangle rotates, what shape is it now? Okay, question number two, do you watch Deal or No Deal? <laughs> if it's yes, we'll just like, you know, you can't, re your score's now capped at 90. Which Noel somehow managed to drag out for 11 seasons. But since the end of Deal or No Deal in 2016, Noel has sadly gone a bit batty in his old age, really. Here is, oh wait, did I hear about him? Wasn't he involved in some like, fake not medicine but like fake uh it, like some like you know like those scientology devices or whatever or like the uh it's like it's not like this that that you um you had you 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 could but like some fake medical device not like a theranos thing it was like way smaller scale it was like mood bracelets or something that he was involved with uh, he recently encouraged UK citizens to follow his example and refuse to pay the TV license fee in protest of the scaremongering tactics used to enforce the collection of the fee. Yeah, TV license is stupid. We talked about this before. It's like something you pay in the UK so you can watch like publicly broadcast stuff. Um, they have it here where I live in, in Czech Republic. I don't pay it uh, because I don't listen to any pr uh, like publicly broadcast radio. I don't have a TV. I mean, I have a TV, but it doesn't have an aerial. So I'm like plugged into my Xbox and it has like all of the streaming apps on it. It's like I'm not watching like what's it called? Cheska Televisor. I'm not watching that. So I'm not paying for it. And you had to I had to like fill out a form saying that I honestly declare that I'm not watching it. And I never have. But I mean if I was watching it, like if I was watching BBC, if I lived in the UK, obviously I'd pay for a television license, because it's kind of the right thing to do, I think. Although I do find it a bit intense that you have to pay it. He might have actually had some, done some good here, I've noticed, over the last few years. The commercials for the TV license have changed tone from the sinister, we're coming to get you if you don't cough up, you vermin, to the rather more light and friendly, why not pay it in easy, bite-sized chunks? Oddly, though, the TV licensing department insisted that Noel Edmonds had never stopped paying his TV license fee. <laughs> what the f***? No, you're also rich enough to just be like, they find me and I paid it. I think it's like a grand or something. It's like a hundred quid and something if you pay it and then it's like a grand if they catch you. So it's like, no, you're rich enough, mate. In 2016, he also got in trouble for posting a tweet which endorsed a bit of kit called the EMP pad. Yes, this is it. Priced at just, oh, it's like a weird mood bracelet. Sh Priced at just over £2,000 a pop. It's a very expensive mood bracelet. Noel claimed that this electromagnetic pulse machine slows aging, lifts depression and stress and tackles cancer. No, it doesn't though, does it? Wow. Damn. Following criticism that he appeared to be promoting a cure for cancer which didn't exist, Noel defended his choice words by insisting that he only claimed it tackled cancer. Mate, you need to look up the definition of tackled in this in this sentence. He was last seen setting up a pet counselling service in which he telephones your pet dog or cat and provides them with words of affirmation and positivity. Danny was right, he is going a bit batty, isn't he? For a bit of a laugh, Radio 2 host Jeremy Vine phoned up Noel live on the air and got him to talk to his pet cat, Dana. The nation roared with laughter as Noel dutifully engaged in a little one-on-one -on -one chat with Dana, which largely revolved around going through all the famous people in the world who were also called Dana. The cat didn't seem to know what he was meant to do with this information. Noel, mate. Noel seems keen to keep his distance from Mr. Blobby. When asked about the likelihood of another on-screen reunion after all these years, Noel bluntly replied, Hopefully not. <laughs> but none of this is Mr. Blobby's fault. He was just a pretty funny and simple joke in those early gotcha segments, but he developed into a joke that got way out of hand and stretched beyond the severe limitations of the initial gag until the joke was on the British public. Even today, he does sometimes get wheeled out for very rare TV appearances. In 2017, comedian Jack Whitehall appeared on the nostalgic TV comedy game show Big Fat Quiz of the 90s and confessed that as a child, he'd always been terrified by the giant pink evil jaundiced baby. And he was clearly uncomfortable as he was forced to confront his fears when Mr. Blobby was revealed as a surprise mystery guest later in the show. We're honored to have one of the decade's most iconic stars. Please welcome 
Apologies, Jack. Mr. Blobby. Oh. I don't understand this, though. That doesn't make any sense. It's like, yeah, yeah, I was really afraid of Mr. Blobby as a child. And now you'll have to confront your fears and face Mr. Blobby. It's like, I'm a, I'm a 35-year-old. I don't know who this guy is, but let's assume he's about my age. I'm a 34-year-old man. I'm not afraid of Mr. Blobby anymore. I was afraid of him as a child. And I wasn't really even afraid. He's just like a bit of a nightmare fuel. As an adult man, I'm like, oh, that's curious. <laughs> it's not a good concept. And as Mr. Blobby, still played by the classically trained Shakespearean actor Barry Killoughby, bounced into the studio, Jack Whitehall cowered in the corner and shrieked incredulously, How the fuck were you allowed near kids? <laughs> uh, he's playing it up though, isn't he? Mr. Blobby was last seen on TV in 2018 on the lunchtime chat show Loose Women, <laughs> which is a funny name show. <laughs> What the f loose women? I've heard of it though. In which the panelists were discussing the impact of the UK's decision to leave the EU. It was vintage blobby. With about 20 seconds of joining the panel on screen, he'd already, taken, he'd already fallen over himself twice. Clearly chosen as a guest on the strength of his unique political insight, Mr. Blobby was asked the question Do you think that if we can't get a deal and we slash the 12,651 EU protectionist tariffs, this will result in a loss or gain to the UK Treasury? And an excited Mr. Blobby responded with the most articulate and coherent statement to be uttered on the show that day. Blobby, Blobby, Blobby. So, I really hope you found that video. This is not very long. Uh, it was brought to you by Geology. If you enjoyed it, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. You can also check out some merch at perchthemerch.co. And thank you for watching. The cowardly cutlets just hid under their bedclothes and begged for the nightmares to stop, f Danny.